my studio guest. So look, here he comes. It's Nick Hounsfield here. Hello. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Really good. good nice to see you, man. Yeah. Nice to see you. Um, we've got uh, for this one. This is this is this is gonna be interesting. We've got we've got East Britain on on the Zoom. So we've got to we've got to do a little bit of a transition here. We've got to put our headphones on. Let's do that. And then we've got to use the special Zoom mic. Okay. okay? It's a good job I'm not drunk. Uh, and uh, figure out how to do it. So we're going to put this mic down and move on to this one here. So um, bear with us. Right, Eastie, can you hear us? Got it, got it, got it, got it, here we go, I can hear you. Bear with us, folks, this is an experiment, it's a world first, remember, this is an ocean this training camp by the internet, and uh, we're just getting ourselves warmed up. Okay, can you hear us, Iski? Yeah, I yes. can, I'm just envious I'm not sitting there at this lovely brunch. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. I know, I know, I've, it's... um. Of course, I've got some weird echoes in my headphones, but um, we'll we'll uh, we'll 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 make this work. So ha the way this is going to work is that this mic is the mic for me and Nick to use. So we're going to be sort of passing around a little bit here. Um, this first session is um, we're actually going to start to explore this connection between ocean health and human health, and we'll we'll tuck into that. This is going to be fascinating, and we're going to start to ease our way into into this world of activism through our relationship with the water. But I thought to start off, it would be lovely to have a few words from each of you, a little bit about, you know, some folks will know your work, some won't. So we can have a little bit about you and, and, you, and what you're doing, and maybe just like what's, what's at the heart of your work today in 2021. Um, so how would you like to play this? Can I, shall I just go, Eski, you start, or would you like to? Yeah, well, on that, I, I guess I'll start. Go for it. <laughs> Hey everyone, uh, all you ocean activists out there, uh, stoked to be at the table with these two lovely lads. Um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, among other things, surfer, writer, marine social scientist. Um, so what that kind of means or looks like um, in terms of my surfing career, I've been surfing since the age of four. I'm born into a surfing family here in where I am right now in Donegal, the northwest coast of Ireland. Uh, pioneered women's big wave surfing in Ireland and introduced surfing with women in Iran, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, and most importantly, I'm a Finisterre ambassador. I've uh, been with this amazing tribe of people for, for a really long time now. And it's been, been wonderful. Um, so we've been involved with a lot of cool projects too. Uh, and I'm author of 50 Things to Do by the Sea. Um, <laughs> just published, so quite excited about that. And with a new one coming out, Saltwater in the Blood in September. So geeking out. You just a lot don't do anything, do you, Iski? No, nothing it's at all. Quite life. Getting to Blue Health. Um, I'm currently, I work as a, yeah, my actual job job is as a Blue Health researcher. So I work with the Inclusive Project um, and European Consortium around adapted surfing and fostering um, greater inclusion and acceptance. Uh, accessibility in surfing in Europe um, but basically as a marine social scientist I, what, what that what does that actually mean but I explore the relationship between people and the sea that's kind of what's at the heart of it in particular the healing power of the ocean and the sea and, and better understanding and reconnecting with that amazing right Nick I'm going to hand it over to you I'm not going to be able to follow that at all but <laughs> never mind um, but yeah my, my name is Nick Hounsfield um, uh, I'm uh, also a surfer, been surfing for about 43, 44 years, um, I know right, uh, and, um, uh, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm the founder of The Wave, which is an inland surf facility um, in Bristol, um, but um, built the whole place really with a very clear um, purpose of trying to connect people, um, get people back into nature, um, also give them a dose of blue health. Um, so being in water, around water, listening to water, um, particularly waves, of course, um, and try to reestablish the disconnect in people 
and waves and then people with planet and they're and they're also in their health um, also I'm uh, chairman of surfing England which again have got very clear remit about trying to create a healthy population of surfers share this one and I'm going to hand it back to Nick quickly but just but I mean this is to both of you as we get into this I'm really sort of fascinated by both of you sort of converging in on this this kind of entanglement of water and health what what has driven you both there um yeah I guess it's you know from a personal point of view um I was an osteopath for many years uh nearly 18 years and really could understand that a lot of people's um uh, lack of health or ill health um, was because of a, a disconnect with nature, with water, and also with themselves, um, and was starting to think about a way in which we could do something at, at scale to be able to improve people's health and well-being. Um, and you know, I've always personally been fascinated by by water. It's always been my go-to place where I need to go to 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 find you know who I am and and try to calm myself down at times or times to reflect. Um, and then more and more as time's gone on, you know, finding out, you know, people like Eski, you, Dan, Lindsay, a whole bunch of people here, Tom from Finisterre, you know, everyone go, we're, we're all very like-minded people um, and realize that there's a real, there's a real movement of people really wanting to, uh, you know, reconnect people to nature and their own human health and also their, their you know, the ocean health. What about you? Yeah. <laughs> I love this. Um, oh, where do you start? I mean, yeah, everything Nick said, it's, so, it's such a personal thing. I mean, as surfers, we're completely immersed in the environment. We're really at the front line of noticing and being aware of how that's changing and uh, directly impacting our health when the sea is sick and polluted. Um, we all have stories of, of how we've gotten ill as well from actually doing the thing we love most and that should make us feel well. Um, so we definitely have plenty of work to do there. So if there's that sense of responsibility then that uh, I certainly felt uh, getting so much from the ocean and like, what, what do we do in return? So it, a, a lot of what this is about too, when we talk about ocean activism for me is around how do we create this culture of care, of reciprocity, when we understand and become aware and deepen that connection with the ocean in return uh, once that relationship is renewed, like what are we doing um, in return? You know, so it's like, like in any relationship, what what makes a healthy relationship? So that's kind of what I've been exploring. And then I think for me, it really shifted, especially when I went to Iran and experiencing women's experiences um, of going into the water for the first time and really realizing. I mean, that completely altered my relationship with surfing and shifted away from it being about a more kind of competitive world that I was immersed in and into realizing the incredible connective properties of being in the sea, having these shared experiences. So how it can really facilitate that connection that Nick talks about with, within our bodies, with each other, um, and then it's certainly beyond us and with the more than human world. Amazing. And, and I think because like today, right, with, the, you know, with this focus on ocean activism and, you know, we mentioned it with Tom earlier, like there's for a lot of people, it brings up um, this kind of like, you know, quite an outward uh, sense, you know, of like tackling problems out in the world and quite a lot of uh, energy and protest and, and what have you. And um, I know, you've, you know, you've been using this term inner activism and I just thought maybe we could, you know, you were talking to this a little bit, but that in itself feels like quite a accessible place to start, right? And something that's so critical, right? Because we're all, you know, people's energies are so needed right now and our sort of ability to be kind of present and to notice what's going on. And can you speak a bit to that? Yeah, great question. And it is about like where we're noticing where is our energy going in in this when it comes to ocean action. Nick, do you want to jump in first or? You go first. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so important, especially I think a lot of the language being used when it comes to like the climate crisis it are these very kind of strong, masculine, almost militarized words off, uh, you know, like tackling and defending and there, but yeah, fighting, combating. Mm. Whereas inner activism, I think it, it plays a really crit critical role, especially when there's, you know, so much burnout in activism. We'll, we'll get to that as well. And I think we'll get to how 
blue health, ocean and human health facilitates something like interactivism. So I think what's happening now is there's a tendency to kind of prescribe or advocate action almost as a way to, um, to, to overcome those really dark emotions or complex feelings that are coming up, um, you know, growing feelings of eco-anxiety and things like that. But jumping straight, like too quickly, making that move too quickly from those painful emotions into action, um, that's when it kind of can become a problem. So I really like listening to work by, uh, and even that there are climate aware psychotherapists now, so like Caroline Hickman, that you know, there's nothing pathological about feeling dark emotions right now because things are really like effed up. Um, so it's a very reasonable um, stress response to a real existential threat. But there's this need first, I feel, to create space where it's possible to feel the feelings and to really honor them, especially in our society, by like talking about difficult feelings without feeling like we're going crazy. So, you know, building our tolerance within our community and society for guilt, for shame, anxiety, depression. So really needing to, as much as we also need to like grow up and take action and get out there, also need to do what Hickman talks about, this kind of growing down, like honoring that process of needing to also be in with those emotions first uh, and not not to like wallow in them <laughs> not yeah. advocating that but you know this to also be aware that it's cyclical there's this ebb and flow and it's we can really by learning to integrate those um emotions and embrace them as these kind of like oncoming waves into what we do it can actually help build resilience and mm -hmm. and more strength and uh, nick maybe you want to come in here so i don't yeah. go on too much no it's all right um I, I, the, o the only thing i can sort of add to that really is that for a lot of people this is the first time they're even having these conversations it, it can be quite can be quite daunting suddenly you know being in a relatively activist community suddenly going oh, i've got to be i've got to i've got to prove my worth to you know really to make some impact um and actually for a lot of people and what we're finding definitely um at the wave where we're, we're creating surfers who are connecting with water for the first time um, and you're starting to have those those conversations for the very first time and it i think it can be quite um i think it's going to be really important that we make sure that we're bringing we're, we're feeding the the sort of pool of people who are likely to be tomorrow's activists and also making sure that it's not too worthy uh, the language is accessible for everyone uh, and making sure that it is a, a language that is emotion based um, so that there there is a, a profound connection that will ride over some of the obstacles in the future um, i think that that for me is is going to be a really important part of making sure that the communication and that relationship is 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 accessible yeah yeah, I love that. Kind of just to add on it, well, what do we mean by this kind of more internal activism or how do you cultivate it? And I, I think Nick's getting at it. Like one of the ways is through this connecting with water and deepening that nature connection for one. Um, I, I really like there's a recent amazing work coming out, I suppose, in terms of research as well, but Joe Hamilton, Hamilton just published a PhD on, on looking at emotional methodologies that can support people in say things like climate activism. Um, I'm like, so I'll get to what that is in just a minute, but again, of ways to work with these tough feelings. So rather, if we don't, what happens? It leads to a kind of emotional paralysis. So you have like, you know, this, this kind of, for me, I find it mind boggling. Why is this sort of, we're at this point of like, still having a social denial <laughs> of the threat we're facing. Oh, you know, as Greta Thunberg saying you know, that a house is burning. Um, why aren't we, you know, taking action and getting out of the burning house and putting the fire out? But it, it's because we, so many of us actually, we, we don't have access to these ways of working with feelings. I mean, our culture and society has encouraged, in particular for men, to suppress feeling our feelings, never mind doing any kind of inner work. So I think emotional methodologies are just simply things like, um, you know, what Nick's talking about, what I've learned from Matt Smith, another Finisterre ambassador around NBC, nonviolent communication, or Jane Nichols' Blue Mind, cultivating that. Um, Dan, your favorite, like having it, your sit spot, like all these things are, are part of our ocean activist toolkit. They, sh they should be. Um, and or even things for me, it's like, my when I do like my menstrual cycle awareness practice then that helps me 
recognize that it's cyclical, there's an ebb and flow, I'm not going to be stuck in <laughs> this void space forever, uh, the feeling will pass. Uh, or even having things like having the sharing circles or book circles or basically anything that helps us kind of create a greater relational awareness and attention of the ways we're engaging with our feelings, how it's influencing our actions, how it influences our perceptions of agency, what we can and can't do. And it essentially comes back to how we're fostering connection and relationship again. Being, being more human. Is I think what we're speaking to, isn't it? That little sad thing we forget. We're humans. We're actually quite, you know, nice creatures that want to like be nice to each other. Um, just I, I, what I want to do, I want to put it back to the G7 quickly, right? Just to, mm. there's two two things I'd love us to just dig into as we as we're coming to this part of the of the panel. I guess one thing is if we zoom out at the look at the big view of of our planet right now, right? And you could say you could say, well, ocean health, planetary health. It, it's you know things you know it's sick right the temperatures are rising there's infections everywhere uh you know the ability to recover is is is, is not quite where it was um you know if it, it, if that was a human um you know we'd say there's a there's illness right it's, it's happening and again if we look at sort of human health at scale we might say there's parallel crisis right i mean you know covid is is obviously one thing um but then there's you know chronic stress related illness which is going through the roof everywhere there's there's obviously mental health and, and, and depression and all these kind of things. So it feels like, you know, there's a really, very clear uh, parallel relationship happening. So what is it that's stopping kind of leadership from kind of seeing these things? And how might we, you know, how do we get our world leaders to actually start to open up to the realities of these parallels? And I guess the last thing to, to we speak to that, and I guess the other question is for everyone listening, um, how does somebody living in you know a city uh in a you know maybe with very in their minds no access to water um how can we what are the things that can help more people maybe start to you know notice open up see this connection what are there practices are there tips are there things how can we help people go on this discovery of, of building this inner activism if you like so two things really yeah you know, what what's going on with our with our planetary and human health and and, and our leaders and and then how can we actually give some 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 specifics to help our our community grow in this space? Nick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really good questions. Um, the thing that that jumps to my mind immediately is is looking at you know ocean health, planetary health, and 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 the connection to the human body. Um, having been an osteopath for eighteen years, it's very holistic practice, um, um, and we always talk about actually finding the health in somebody not the ill health so it's very very easy to just concentrate on where it's gone wrong focus on the disease focus on the illness and try to try to combat that by by making a radical change you know cut you know cut something out or or um you know massive medication to try and try and do something uh, make a big intervention um that maybe is not sustainable as well um and i've already you know really noticed that if we can if we can tackle ocean climate um and planetary climate using it in that same model on making sure that we're looking at the health of the place there's a lot of good stuff that still here is here that we can utilize not just ourselves um in terms of being able to change our practice but also looking at the areas where if we are allowed to you know potential potentially um um, you know, fisheries be a, be able to bloom, get, you know, protect them, create a space whereby they can they can actually regenerate themselves. We need to have a bit more power on the fact that um, you know natural environments can can turn this still around, and at the same time sort out our own our own problems that we you know we need to stop various practices, but also have faith. Uh, I'm I'm a real optimist at heart, so it's about having faith that there's enough out there, enough good out there that you can still change that. Um, Iski, what's yeah, I, I love that holistic insight. I completely agree. It's, it's um, yeah, it's really recognizing that interdependence, isn't it? And this, this notion that like, nature is not some kind of frill or add on, it's totally integral to our whole like biopsychosocial kind of health and well-being. Um, and then, okay, how do you, yeah, how do you speak 
about you know blue health to those in power and policymakers and politicians well i think right now we have a, a, a unique opportunity in many ways as the link is finally being made that you know our um unwellness as, as a human society is really being mirrored by what the you know the ecological harm we're doing and this reality that we can't be well in the 6c is you know starkly being realized with covid but so there's an opportunity there to really kind of push how like tapping into water's healing power can actually help cut public health costs because they're going to be there's such a huge burden on our public health system which we've also realized so maybe you know it's a case of i think Yes, breaking out of our silos. I'm not an economist, but I, there is power in, you know, even, for example, visits apparent to natural places in England were worth 2.18 billion in annual health benefits. Um, and then for water and blue space, we have strong evidence now that like blue spaces are the most restorative um, environments for humans, directly reducing our like psychological stress. So in terms of like post-pandemic recovery, it, it's going to be key. Um, and then, yeah, it speaks to what you're asking, Dan, too, about this, the urban aspect and inland communities. So, you know, a big limitation around Blue Health is also accessibility as well as inclusion and diversity. Um, and it's there's shifts being made in that. And I know it's amazing what you're doing at the Wave, Nick, to really address that. I mean, it's a perfect example. Um, and something like you know, the Blue Health Research Project has looked at uh, that in urban settings in Europe, and they've coined this sort of idea of urban acupuncture. So local community-based ways to improve access to blue spaces in urban settings. And, and Dan, we talked about, like, I love this idea of, I, you interviewed Jay Nichols a while back too, of, of asking the question, where is your water? You know, we talk about the sea and the ocean, but like all water is connected. Um, there's a, the amazing European Atlas of the Sea has these different kind of maps you can look at. And one of them is just you can hone in on, riv on rivers and it just shows the whole network of waterways across all of Europe, UK and Britain. And it's it's just incredible. You realize actually it's it's like all water. <laughs> so you can definitely find where your water is. And I love this. Anything that connects, like, as you say, streams to sea. Um, there's a brilliant initiative in Canada underway too, where they have a huge inland population there, despite their massive coastline called Stream to Sea. So those kinds of initiatives are, are, are key, especially as most pollution is, is land-based, you know, that ends up in the ocean. Nick, what are you learning from the wave about people that are connecting in? Are they finding ways to, to, take, to take this on into their lives without, you know, once they've come out of an experience, how, how's it shifting people when they're back in their their urban places um yeah i think well i think the, the the main thing that that i'm noticing every single day many times a day is actually the fact that people through the pandemic and lockdown really have missed being near or in water um and and it's something that I can see that people are now making a commitment that they want to change that. They realize that they were not in a great space because of that lack of connection, be, not being able to go outside, um, not being able to feel free in their minds and in their spirits as well as their bodies. Um, and they're now making a commitment, not necessarily to come to the wave you know, more often or anything like that, although that is happening. It's actually just realizing this is, this is really important for me uh, and it's the first time that I've been able to have particularly men come up to me and say, actually, I've really struggled over the last year. And it's like, some of my dearest friends won't say that to me, but I've got people just coming straight up to me and going, I've had a really bad year. This, this has become my, my sanctuary. I'm feeling so much better for having done that. Um, and that then immediately just goes to me, right, we need to get people who can't no normally afford or don't have access to this mm -hmm. we need to we need to make sure that they have access to that because it could otherwise just be something that becomes a middle white you know white um, um, playground that people are engaged with and it's then you know my responsibility I believe is now spreading that word and trying to make sure that that's accessible for other people so um, listen, I've just, I've just had a, I've just had a message from the G7, right? They said you've you both you've got an hour with the world leaders, right? Uh, this weekend, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to say to them uh, about blue health? Come on, I want to hear from you. Well, 
like the very first thing that comes to my mind is that, and I was thinking this, they're in Cornwall, they're probably near the beach. Um, I would do what we do with the wave makers when you guys we come to Portugal and the very first activity we do to like break out of our silos to like, you know, humble ourselves and connect with what's meaningful is wave play. So going, I take them all body surfing, you know, throw them out into the shore break with some hand planes and yeah, and then see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 100, I 100% agree. You know that's such a leveling experience when when we do that um, with the wave makers, and and it is something. And I'm not I'm not here to plug your book, but your book does cover a load of the you know that that playing, you know actually being being, you know really present at that time in terms of what what's going on in the waves, but also what's going on, you know, in the shoreline. We then do litter picks, and then we do various exercises which are really good childlike play that brings you back to yourself and go actually a whole load of this there's a whole load of politics all sorts of um things going on there let's just be childlike again and really appreciate it i've just got boris and biden do 50 things by the sea to do by the sea that would yes, sort it all out wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> boris and biden go body surfing i love it <laughs> I love it. So, guys, so we got, um, we're going to have to wrap up now. Um, it's been amazing to have you, you both here and what you do. Extraordinary. I, I encourage everyone just, you know, check out what uh, uh, Nick and Isky are up to. You can find out through their, follow their, their, their feeds and their work. And there's so many ways that they're constantly offering up ways for you to connect with this kind of work. So thank you so much and um, look forward to seeing you both again soon. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. Good to see you, Ski, as ever. Yeah, so good to see you guys. That flew by. <laughs> Have fun. Know. See you later. Yeah. Right, right, folks. So um, that was the first panel that worked. You're all still here. Hope you're having fun wherever you are. Um, we're going to move into the first workshop now, I think. So uh, um, all things being equal, we'll be uh, we'll be back shortly. Enjoy. <laughs>